co-hosted with um, the Center for Population Health and Community Impact and the Department of Health Management and Policy, which I am the chair. For those of you who don't know me, I've been here a year, I'm Alex Ortega. Um, I think I know most of you guys in the group. Um, we are very uh, pleased to have our first, so my center's inaugural uh, lecturer at the school's uh, first lecture for the year, Population Spotlight, Dr. Lisa Simpson. Um, I got to know Dr. Simpson probably in 2000 when she was the Deputy Director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in D.C. Um, she's currently the CEO and President of Academy Health, which is the professional organization for health policy and management. Um, prior, to her, prior to her appointment at Academy Health, she was a professor at the University of Cincinnati and ran the Center for Children's Health Policy um, at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, she's a pediatrician um, trained in, in Trinity College in Ireland. Um, she also has an MPH from the University of Hawaii where she was trained in epidemiology. So uh, she's also a fellow epidemiologist who does health services research. And um, she's going to talk today about um, evidence and innovation in population health and health equity. So uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Simpson. All right. So, um, are you are you uh, taking care of my mic so I don't have to do anything? Okay, it's on. Okay, <laughs> just making sure that all the technical stuff is working. So, um, thank you, Alex, and and thank you, Dr. Diaz Ru, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I always enjoy going and speaking at sort of. Uh, my uh, peer institution, schools of public health, because that's where I cut my teeth after my pediatric residency doing my MPH. Um, and my first real job, as I like to say, after my training was I was maternal and child health director for the state of Hawaii in the state health department. So very much uh, come out of sort of public health roots and um, actually moved on to focus on health services, research and health policy, because I actually got very frustrated uh, directing a categorical program um, and not understanding the bigger picture and of, of health and health care in this country and how policy was both supporting my ability to improve the lives of women and children, but also limiting it and sort of had a rather, you know, fortuitous and very often serendipitous uh, career trajectory. But love this work at Academy Health because it really sort of blends uh, what I love, which is bringing new knowledge, you know, making sure you generate new knowledge and evidence that can help improve uh, health and health care, but also um, getting people to use it. Because, um, you know, while I've been a full-time academic, I really want things to change as well. And um, a quip I heard once, uh, I don't know if you've heard it, is that if, um, if you thought changing history was hard, try changing a history department. <laughs> So <laughs> there are all sorts of other good reasons to be full-time academics, but uh, <laughs> I heard it from a, a colleague at the population, the Health and Society Scholars Program. So, um, so I'm going to move around. It, can you see these, or do, should we dim the lights a little bit? Or maybe the front lights, yeah, and maybe the back ones. Is that better? Okay, so um, I'm going to cover four areas. First, ground us all in some definitions. Um, how many of you are faculty? Okay, so I'll go over the definitions fast. How many of you are students? How many of you are not any of the others? <laughs> okay, so where, where are you from, just to get to know you guys a little bit? The non-faculty, non-student participants? Staff. Staff, okay, great. Any community folks? Any people in the health department or healthcare settings or partners? No, okay. Well, the reason I ask that is because um, you're gonna hear this theme of partnership a lot in my talk because I think it's really core to sort of the future of public and population health. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about Academy Health. How many of you have ever heard of Academy Health? Okay, good, so some of you. Then I'm gonna focus on sort of where we're, we're seeing uh, trends and progress and evidence, but where we still have so many remaining needs. And this is not a systematic review. Let me give you all my caveats, you know, of the evidence for population health. You guys are far more expert at that than I would be. Um, but just to show you some highlights of things we've been focusing on and our members have been focusing on in terms of progress and needs. And then finally, I'm going to focus on innovation, some areas where 
we see some real potential for the future in population health and health disparities. So here's the definition of health services research, and I always like to say that I have to have better lung capacity than I currently have to get through that definition in one breath. Um, but basically, you see it's the field, it's multidisciplinary, it's individuals and populations, it's kind of everything under the sun. I mean, this is the IOM formal definition. It's very good. But I like to sort of say, in a nutshell, it's really about figuring out what works um, in not only in healthcare, but also increasingly in population health. The field of health services research, by its very name, health services research, has very, you know, its history and its uh, sort of ontogeny comes out of the focus of health policy and um, spending in healthcare services. So while it has uh, its roots more in the care side, it's always had a part of its, uh, of its membership and focus on population health. Dave Kindig, you know, gave lectures at our uh, association, you know, 25 years ago. So that's always been a thread, but like everywhere else, population health is also really growing in the interests of our members in the field. So what works to improve health and, and health care, not only in general, but for whom as a pediatrician? You know, I was trained in medicine to know about the 70 kilo white male. I, I don't think they still train medical students that way, but as, you know, clearly I wasn't one of those. Um, and as a pediatrician, my patients were, weren't those either. So really understanding which interventions, which services work for whom, under what circumstances, at what cost. And then another big focus, I think, these days is once we know what works in one context, how do you take it to scale? You know, how much adaptation, fidelity of the intervention is needed? What's that balance to actually take it to other communities and be successful? Now, within health services research, we also have public health services research, which really emerged, and I don't know, I don't know, 15 years ago, 10, 10 12 years ago, as sort of a subset. Its, uh, its emergence actually kind of tracks or is parallel to what I call child health services research. We wrote a paper in 97 in JAMA about why there were some unique features of children's health that needed to be addressed by the services research community to really get good evidence. Similarly, public health defined itself this way, which looked at the organization, financing, and delivery of public health services within communities and the impact of these services on public health. Importantly, um, this does not say governmental public health. So it's important that these are public health services but increasingly, as we're seeing changes in, in the financing and organization of public health services, the question is, you know, are they delivered by the, pub, the, the governmental sector or other community partners? And to what extent is healthcare going to actually step up to the plate and for which services? Because obviously there are a number of core public health services which will always remain in the governmental sector. So definition determinants of health, of course, um, you know, Kindig and Stoddard, they, uh, the, that definition of population health there, this should be all very well familiar to you as I was um, learning a little bit more about Drexel this morning and your history of focus on social determinants, social justice, and health as a human right. Clearly, this is um, a, a well-known frame for you. Um, for those who are newer to the population health frame, they're still just learning this, and it kind of boggles my mind 30 years into my career that I, I still have to kind of explain that to some folks. Um, and then finally, to make clear, um, what, when we think about health equity and health disparity, that they are, they are actually different um, things. And so health equity is defined as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people, and it goes on. Um, whereas health disparity is defined um, in legislation uh, determined by the director of the center for, uh, the, which is now the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities after consultation. And it focuses where there's a significant disparity in any one of these dimensions of health status compared to the general population. And one of the things that just happened earlier this week, I think, is that NIMHD just declared, um, I think, sexual minorities, LGBT, as a disparity population. So that's you know, taking it into the frame um, for uh, health disparity. So those are some sort of, at least the way I see the world most of the time, some definitions that then inform the rest of my remarks. So what do we do at Academy Health that you might be interested in uh, re relevant to public and population health? So this is our, our mission here that we work with our members and we focus not just on improving health, but um, it's the performance of the health system and health. And that's a change. In the six, almost six years I've been CEO, we've really st emphasized more the health aspect not just the health system aspects. But what is unique about what we do is 
we're always working on the interaction of evidence and decision making. Whether, and that decision making is both policy decision making at the federal state level, um, not so much local level, really federal state, um, but also increasingly um, practice in health systems as well. Um, our three goals are pretty straightforward. Build a vibrant and diverse community of folks who produce research and use it. Um, and advance the science. And I'm going to focus sort of my, um, my uh, innovation remarks really around innovation in the science of health services and policy research to promote population health and, um, and health, uh, health equity. And then we spend a lot of our time, which after talking with your dean, I, I know is of great importance here as well, on getting people to use it. And here it's not just doing you know, your one page or for the policy audience, but we, we work with lots of different partners to try to get evidence into use, but also advancing sort of the, the art and science of translation. How do we do this better? Because you know, you've heard the old adage of it takes 17 years to get 14% of research to the benefit of patient care. You know, it, it was from a patient care frame. Um, and we've all heard that for 20 years. And so we're really trying to figure out are there better, quicker ways to, to, to shorten that time frame and increase the yield. And so we do that by this circle of, you know, it's the life cycle of research. You don't just start thinking about your research question, or you shouldn't be, um, and then worrying about once it's completed, what do you do with the results? You should be thinking about the stakeholders, the end users from the get-go, and then throughout the um, development of your research so that you know how to translate and disseminate your results. Um, if you've heard of us, you may have heard of our conferences. Those are uh, our four major events during the year. I just wanted to sh uh, showcase the uh, content that's around population health. The National Health Policy Conference is in February every year. Four sessions out of 16 concurrent. So that's a quarter of the content is around public and population health, as well as always one of the plenaries. The Data Palooza is a new event very much focused on innovations around data. And we have five sessions focused on issues of cross-sector data and population health. The annual research meeting, if you think 115 abstracts out of 2,000 doesn't sound like a lot, it's still the top three or fourth, second, third, or fourth abstract number getter. So it's still one because there are so many different themes. Um, so it gets a lot of abstracts, lots of sessions and posters. Um, and then this is the one that's coming up in December. I mentioned to Alex the deadline for early reg is tomorrow. Um, and it's, it has a track on population health. And there's also a linked workshop on training in dissemination and implementation research. So you, you really, there's a little bit for everybody who's interested in these things. We off, obviously do some, oh, that picture didn't come out looking too well. Um, but various um, pu uh, publications that, that are developed in partnership with our members. Um, and then our final component is training. So while we're not doing you know, degree granting programs, a big part of our mission is to build this workforce that focuses on health services, on population health. And so there are a number of scholarships available. And we have a population health scholarship program that brings you to Washington to um, get trained in working with policymakers. And that is still open. So would encourage you guys to encourage your students and, and colleagues to, to apply. Um, and then finally, we have student chapters. And you don't have one. We have 28 student chapters around the country. Um, and would love to talk to you some more about having a student chapter. Um, because student membership is only $40, and we just need an active uh, faculty champion to work with us. And th this really helps students in their careers. And then finally, we have a Center for Diversity and Inclusion and Minority Engagement, a big priority for our board and for me personally and for our, our senior leadership at Academy Health is to ensure that our workforce in health services research is more diverse and inclusive. Who are the underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities? No surprise, African American, Latino, and Native American. Um, but we also have gender um, uh, diversity issues still. Um, and interestingly, when we did a survey a few years back of our members, we found that while in general our field is very happy with their work, the, per the percentage who are dissatisfied was twice as high among women compared to men. So you know, women, faculty, et cetera, still um, a number of issues there. So with that backdrop, what do we see from our you know, little viewpoint, our little corner of the world, um, about sort of progress in evidence and remaining needs? So first, when I say what do I, you know, evidence, what am I talking about? So it's not just your, your RCT. It's not just your epi study. 
um, we're actually pretty inclusive in our definition. And so you see here, you know, obviously the, the data is just exploding from all kinds of new sources as well. So data is now, you know, do you have a data science program at Drexel? Yeah, because the the Harvard the school, the Chan School of Public Health just established a new master's in data science, health data science. So this is a big new focus, and you know I I, I, I still have to learn and understand when is health data science not what I know as epi or <laughs> statistics or health services research. So I'm I'm still learning. Sometimes we like to define you know old wine in new bottles, right? But because uh, it's the new term. Um, Importantly, both quantitative and qualitative, and, and, and increasingly the use of mixed methods. The gray literature is incredibly important, particularly it's, it's always been important. And there are issues with, you know, OK, the rigor, and it doesn't have peer review potentially. But right now, with the amount of transformation and disruption that's going on and how services are delivered in this country and how communities are working together or not to address health challenges of their population and communities, a lot of the learning is, is being published in gray literature. And so importantly, it's to try to sort of see where's that early evidence that then needs to be more rigorously evaluated. And then very importantly, particularly for translation to policymakers at both the federal and state level, um, is the importance of systematic reviews. When we did a survey of state policymakers a couple years ago, uh, because we have a robust program focusing on state policymaking and translating research to them, um, we found that, uh, and I was surprised by this finding, and we asked where do they get their information and what, how do they rank and value certain sources. And systematic reviews was like 65% of the policymaker audience respondents um, said that they looked to systematic reviews. So increasing sophistication. Again, it's not universal among policymakers, but increasing sophistication about understanding that it's not just one finding, it's a body of evidence that you should be basing your decisions on, or at least informing your deliberations when you weigh different uh, pros and cons. So then I think you can, again, ha what are, those are some of the, the types of evidence and how evidence is used. We have members who are working on every single aspect. Um, and I think historically, the field of health services research and public health services research, I think, has spent a lot of time on one and two. So documenting and monitoring the health needs, the, pop, you know, the, the disparities, et cetera, identifying and understanding why do we have these, what are the contributing factors, the root causes. But we have spent much less as a field figuring out what to do about it and how to translate that and use it and then evaluate and report on the findings. And I think, in general, that's a trend that we're, we're really trying to work with our field to get much better at the methods and the approaches for these last three types of evidence that we need. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the, this HSR PROJ? So this is a database from the National Library of Medicine that they've ma maintained for over 25 years, I think. We're a, we're a contractor to them. But importantly, if you want to know who's doing research on any topic, that's defined as health services research, and that does include population health and health disparities. Um, this not only, you know, as opposed to the NIH uh, reporter database, this has public and private sector funded uh, grants. So you can really get a s good sense of sort of what's happening now. It doesn't have results, it doesn't have abstracts, but it's a funded grants, and it's, it's not just based on volunteer sort of submissions. We actively reach out to the funders and, uh, on a quarterly basis and say, what have you funded lately? So obviously there's a time lag, but it's a great data set. And part of what we do at Academy Health is look at sort of research on research. You know, where's the field going? What are some of the trends, et cetera? And this is a great source for that. So here are some of the reports we've done. Um, this one here, uh, oh, I have a, wait, I was instructed how to do this. Yes, there we go. Public Health Services and Systems Research, trends between those years. Um, an overall state of the field, and then uh, a, a study I'm going to talk about in a minute on health disparities focused health services research. So um, definitely useful for understanding trends. Now a more recent one, and uh, Dr. diaz Ru and I were talking about urban health. Um, this was presented at the Academy Health meeting this past June in, in uh, Boston, but working with partners at the Big Cities Health Coalition, they used health services research, HSR Praj, whoa. Okay, hit the right button. There, this one. 
um, to look at projects that came out of either querying this way, urban health, and then indicators, and then found the subset that um, they then analyzed, 149, to look at what kind of research is happening in partnership with big city health departments. And so most of the projects they found, not surprisingly, are happening in the largest cities that have links to major universities, hospitals, and research centers. So that's where the bulk of it is happening. The five most commonly researched topics for the Big Cities Health Coalition were obesity, cancer, HIV, physical activity, and child health. So importantly, one of the things that has been part of the conversation is to what extent are health departments focusing on more chronic diseases and the shift away from the sort of infectious vaccine, MCH kind of focus and then focusing on chronic diseases. And this is just a word cloud of the research topics that they were looking at. But then finally, um, for the research that's happening with these uh, large city health departments, um, it, they, it's all the funding is coming from eight supporting organizations. So that just, again, gives you a sense of sort of what's happening in research in partnership with health departments. Um, Turning from that to health disparities and health equity research, this is a um, graph from an article by Stephen Thomas um, that I use a lot in my talks because it really resonates for me and sort of echoes the comment I made earlier about the types of research and where it talks about first generation disparities research is about detecting the disparity, second generation is understanding the causes of the disparity, third generation is providing solutions, and fourth generation is supporting taking action. Um, again, most of the disparities research has been here. Much more of it needs to be here. What can we actually do about the disparity research? And increasingly, not just in the health or public health sector, but to a point I'm going to make um, in the innovation section, how do we work across sectors to address the disparities? Um, and so the HSR PRAJ study that we did to look at disparities, you'll see here that in 2007, um, the, the vast majority of the studies were much more in the um, detect and understand component um, and then went up over time so that actually by this time uh, more than um, half were in the um, uh, eliminate and so I don't know if you can actually read that but um, between 2007 and 2011 health disparities focused HSR project had become increasingly concerned with un understanding or eliminating health disparities as opposed to just detecting which is a 93 percent increase in um, over the five-year period in another report that you may have seen, this was, uh, came out of work that was funded, if you're familiar with the Finding Solutions Program, it was funded to Marshall Chin um, in uh, Chicago. And uh, while the program has ended, the website and all the resources and, and, and reports are still available. They did a systematic review of 30 years of disparities intervention research and found that, uh, you know, you can see the numbers they found, but what was most common um, were that most of the interventions for disparity reduction were education and training, i.e. much more focused on the patient or recipient or experiencer of the health equity challenge or disparity. Um, least common type was financial incentives. Um, again, the focus of the intervention was either on the patient in the care setting or on community members, and, and you see the diseases. And they go on to conclude that um, trying to see, no, um, they go on to conclude that it's sort of, it's the system stupid. Instead of focusing on trying to change the behaviors of the individual, we need to focus on the context of the communities and the conditions within which these individuals live to really think about addressing disparities. Moving from that to some recent reports that we commissioned uh, to look at sort of recommendations for the future of public health services research, this one by Julie Willems. Um, uh, and this is a diagram from the report that was published from here looking really at, the, again, that cycle of, of research in PHSR. She calls for collaborative cross-sector evidence building for also the importance of engaging and motiv understanding what motivates leaders to lead collective action. What is the skill set that a health department leader, because some, some local health departments, state health departments, are very active in collective action, and you've probably heard of backbone organizations and, and these different models of really, you know, how do you work across sectors in a community to achieve collective action and real impact on health at the community mm -hmm. level. But she calls for a, a much better understanding of both what motivates and how do you then support leaders to, to lead these collective action efforts. Um, and then, uh, not surprisingly, also calls, you know, highlights how, um, 
how expensive and hard it is to do multi-sector, multidisciplinary, multi-partner research, and that you really have to think through and have adequate resources to advance community health improvement. It's not an isolated, um, it's not work you do in isolation. So then her recommendation, um, after she um, points these things out, or one of her final concluding comments is, these recommendations maximize the real life, real time laboratory of how local health departments and their local community partners are deploying health improvement strategies. It will require PHSSR researchers to increase their skill and acceptance of an emergent approach, approach that relies more heavily on qualitative, descriptive, and or quasi-experimental designs. And so I think it's a, a real challenge to sort of a maybe more traditional quantitative researchers you know, where we, we want to define our hypothesis, our data collection strategy, it's all nailed down. But when you start working in the messy world, as you guys do here, of sort of partnered research, where the question changes over time maybe, and the, the data points have to evolve, um, I think it's a different skill set that we as investigators need, be, need to be trained in so that we um, have those leadership and quantitative and, and analytic skills to, to know how to work in, in these different designs. Another paper that we commissioned was uh, by Betty Beckmeyer, um, and it's titled, you see the title down here, The Population Health Fashion Mish Mismatch with Health Departments. She's basically saying that the word population health is so in fashion now, everybody's using it, but it's kind of this total mismatch with where um, health departments, public health departments are in this conversation. Um, and so she really um, focuses on the model of academic health departments and how the the capacities of academic health departments with partnerships with academic centers can really help to sort of either bring public health to the table of this, this fashionable population health conversation um, or, um, you know, really play a central role. And in fact, um, I can't remember the new group that just published it, but there's a new paper out um, and this, it, it also echoes this term that we've uh, heard recently of health departments need to play the role of the chief health strategist for a community. They may not do everything, but they have a role of sort of the overall strategy. Now, depending on your community, again, one of the things I've learned in 30 years of doing this work is that we're a big country. I mean, I've lived, I've lived and worked in Hawaii, Ohio, Florida, and Washington. Hey, one size sure don't fit, fit all. And, you know, different health departments are, you know, they, the old adage, you've seen one health department, you've seen one health department. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying every community, the health department is going to be the right person to be the chief health strategist, but I think it's a really important concept of how we think, and it goes back to the, core, you know, the needs assessment, policy development, and I always forget the third one, uh, the core functions of the three things from the 80s in public health. But um, So Betty calls for, again, leveraging the current efforts in the public health system modernization to really build on whether it's FAB and the focus on QI and all this work in public health to really bring academic health department model forward. Um, but also ch she calls on us to include health system partners outside of governmental public health and sort of again with this move towards health care uh, potentially taking on some different roles. Um, thinking about how the academic health department would be just health department academics but who else should be at, in that uh, role. And, um, and then also that the academic health department model really should be leveraged to get new interest and, and energy from new investigators in PHSSR. So hopefully many of you, your colleagues in other schools of public health, um, getting interested in this model. So those are some of the other needs identified. The last uh, future needs I want to mention is another uh, type of activity that Academy Health does, which is the listening project. We heard very much from our member researchers that they wanted to know what, what are the policy issues in Washington that people need answers to. Now, not tomorrow, because that's, sometimes that's the question, is I need this answer today or tomorrow. But in three years, what kinds of questions do you think you're going to really be grappling with? So focusing on that three to five year time horizon, we've published reports looking at Medicare information needs. This is Medicaid. Uh, I'm going to show you some Medicaid. This is the Medicaid one. And a third one that we just completed this year um, on safety net delivery systems. And so what are their information and research needs that we should be, you know, working on now to try to answer? And so um, the Medicaid policymaker ones, uh, we actually had s uh, additional funding from MACPAC, the Medicaid and CHIP pay Access and Payment Commission, or however those acronym, the acronym is made. 
uh, because they saw the Medicare report and they said, oh, this is really useful. We need one of these for Medicaid. And so obviously Medicaid is actually more complicated than Medicare. Folks who don't do Medicaid policy don't realize that. But takes, you have to talk to a lot more people. Um, and uh, so you see here who we talk to. And, um, and there were a number, there, this is available on our website, number of priorities were identified. Um, so the big one, duh, like what difference does it make whether you expand or don't expand Medicaid, right? Kind of a big difference, but there's still a lot. It always amazes me how basic some of the questions of state policymakers are that, that are still critically important. That doesn't, that's not to be dismissive, but you need not only data to answer the question, but the other thing is current data. If your data is five years old, they'll say, oh, well, that was a different time then. Things are different now. So the currency of your answer is also critical. Um, high cost, high need enrollees, you know, with the hot spotting. I also hear less about it, but I love the cold spotting. Like in communities where things are great, what's going on there? You know, it's that positive deviance. Let's, we're always focused on the deficit model. Let's look at some positive deviance uh, ex examples and, and do cold spotting. Um, and then obviously the focus on payment and delivery reform. So the last section I wanted to focus on, innovation. Um, and there are three areas that I want to touch on. Innovations in data, innovations in methods, and the thing everybody's talking about, you know, cross-sector collaboration. So, um, so first, data. Well, um, if any of you had, uh, attended the annual research meeting in Boston this year, there was a lot on data. Um, a lot of talk around linking data from different sources, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit more. But increasingly, they're also, because this is hard stuff, it's not that easy. Just because suddenly, you know, you're practicing docs in your community, have electronic health record data, doesn't mean you can actually, it's research quality, that you can link it, that you would want to link it if you could, um, and then bringing in housing or transportation data, all that. It's, it's really tough methodologically to figure out how to do this. And so increasingly we're seeing communities of practice forming to learn from each other about how to do this better. And I'll mention a couple. Um, the new types of data, I already mentioned, not just um, the, the sector, sectorally defined types of data, um, but basically the digital footprint we're all leaving in this world every single day that we walk around. Um, online, our wearables, the quantified self, this explosion of bits and bytes is, uh, you know, a potentially treasure trove of information. My worry sometimes with these data science, you know, conversations is that, you know, we're going to find all these spurious associations. If you have completely atheoretical approaches to just gobs of data, what are you going to end up with? So, um, and that's why I think learning from each other and figuring out what's, you know, the uh, separating the wheat from the chaff, I think, is going to be important. And then finally, the the real push for open data. And I think we're seeing more and more push to get not just public sector data out, but also private sector data out. Um, this is a slide from a, um, a special issue that Aaron Holvey and Glenn Mays, um, they did this editorial, but it was a special issue of eGENS, which is a journal that we began publishing at Academy Health. We already, our official journals are HSR, the journal of HSR, and Health Affairs. But eGENS is a journal very much focused, it's peer reviewed, open access, and it's focused on the how you did the work, not what did you find. So it's very much around using new data streams. And this was a whole special issue around public health services research. So again, traditional data sources, various systems of measurement that we are all familiar with, um, and then these new and emerging data sources. And they talk about that. So we're seeing more and more of, of this that we're working on. One of the communities of practice that I alluded to, we uh, manage. We, um, started it, and we were just talking about, I think, one of the meetings that led to its formation. Um, and we call it PopCop. Um, and um, so it's, it's basically state and local big city health departments working together on these issues of data. How do they link data? How do they share data? A lot of governance and analytic issues. Um, so you can see there. And then the members, you can see them right here. Um, so uh, a pretty diverse set of um, institutions. Um, not Philly, but maybe. Where, where's Philly? Oh, city of Philly, yes. I, I guess, I don't know if it's, who would be involved? I don't, I don't yeah. Um, so um, and so they, they work together. Um, and then the other thing on data, I mentioned the data palooza. These are just the faces of some of the speakers this past May. Big emphasis on, on new and, and different ways of applying data. 
So lots of innovation happening there. And codathons, hackathons, data challenges, that's sort of, these are all new words I had to learn in the last couple years. Um, but really quite fascinating. It's, it, it, it brings sort of a different energy. I'm, you know, uh, I have to tell you this quick anecdote. I'm, I know I'm short on time, but um, we, uh, we gave out a, a, the award at Datapalooza for the Health Data Liberator. So it's the, it was the fourth year, and it was awarded to Fred Trotter. I don't know if you've ever heard of Fred Trotter. You might want to follow him on Twitter. He's, he's quite out there kind of guy, and he basically makes all this kind of data available. And uh, Pro Vice President Joe Biden was speaking at the Data Palooza. It was the last minute, like three weeks before the event. We heard he was coming. And he'll allow us to have you know, 12 people in a picture line, so you get to have your photo shaking the Vice President's hand. And so you know, these various people were picked. And we added Fred to the list because he won the award and you know, important. And he shows up with a bright red Sriracha t-shirt, flip-flops, shorts. You know, he's shaved his head bald you know, since the last time I'd seen him. And he gets in line, he gets up to Joe, and I'm introducing each of the people who are get, you know, in the line, so-and-so, is this important person, president, blah, 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 of this company, or whatever. And this is Fred Trotter, <laughs> who won the Health Data Liberator Award. And Joe Biden goes, I don't know what you do, but you must be good at it to dress like that. <laughs> So, so it, it, it's a different kind of world, and it's, uh, but very exciting innovation going on there. So then a bit closer to home, sort of our methods in our field. What are we doing? What's innovative in methods? And I'm sure you guys, you know, you might have uh, a different pick list of what you think is innovative. But here are four that we're very much focused on, and I'm going to touch on each one briefly. Um, so first, engage scholarship. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, Depending on what type of research and the user you're interested in, you call it something different. So community-based participatory research is one tradition and one deep field that um, I know you guys are working in and others. Um, folks who work embedded in health systems, whether it's the Kaiser Research Center or Denver Health or others, Geisinger, you know, they're driven by the, many of them by the needs of their operational leaders. It's systems relevant, obviously policy relevant research. Um, and then the latest kid on the block sort of is the PCOR, the patient-centered outcomes research. But across all of them, we're talking about engaged scholarship, where you're from the get-go, you're formulating your research question with the end user in mind, the affected person. And so I think it's, it's a, a very exciting, different way of doing things. Um, and I see that's a, a and, and learning how to do it well um, in not a tokenistic way. And it's sometimes uncomfortable. It's like, oh, but I want to study this. No, but this is more important. And so it's, it's really about working in partnership and learning how to do that and developing the, the social skills and as well as the technical skills to do that. Um, I put this slide in here, which is from Marianne Bates at the J-PAL. I don't know if any of you have heard of J-PAL. Kind of a reminder to me that we are working a lot at Academy Health on the issue of evaluating complex interventions. Um, not just in clinical services and medical homes and, you know, these ACOs and, you know, take whatever acronym that's popular now. It's complex and we're focused much more on context. And we had a workshop last December that Marianne spoke at, this was her slide, where she talked about the promise of randomized evaluations in public health. So we're, we, we're building on the workshop. We've been partnering with our colleagues in the UK who are also very you know, a colleague who came to Boston, she just finished a, an actual RCT of um, a, a trial in London to reduce uh, disparities for disparity populations in London. So again, trying to use every method as appropriate, the most rigorous possible for the amount of money you have and the time frame you have to answer the question. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work on complexity. We've been doing system science scholarships as well, trying to bring in more of that system science um, approach to uh, research. So I think that's another area where I see a lot of innovation in our field. Um, and then to the uh, QI science um, and implementation science, one of the things we're seeing more, and I started doing some of this in uh, Cincinnati when I was there at Cincinnati Children's, where they're very well known in the care sector as true innovators in improvement and you know, clinical improvement. And they took the methods of improvement and uh, started working at the community level on infant mortality reduction, on childhood obesity, on asthma reduction in the community at the population. So using the methods of an improvement frame, but uh, addressing population health issues. And, um, uh, and Lion and Raphael, in their 
report talked about that um, they came up with a set of you know, recommendations for how health disparities researchers could work with quality improvement science to, again, uh, use some of these different methods to and you know, call for more rigorous evaluation methods, the evidence base for interventions, directly engaging the social determinants, and leveraging community resources. Um, and they conclude that basically new partnerships between communities, providers serving vulnerable populations, and QI researchers will be required for any QI intervention approaches to actually address social determinants. So it's again, it's about bridging disciplinary and theoretical communities to make the resultant research stronger and more, uh, uh, more resulting in better impact. And then finally, cross-sector collaboration. Um, and I have I'm finishing at one, right? Yeah, yeah right. Um, so focusing on cross-sector collaboration, um, I think all of you have seen RWJ's action framework. Um, while there were definitely pioneers, and, and you guys, I'm sure, were one of them who were talking about this well before this action framework, this has ca catapulted. The RWJ's shift to a culture of health has catapulted national and research and community interest in this cross-sector work. And so I think we, we, it's really important to acknowledge that it's an incredible opportunity to look across their 10, now you can't see this, this is their 10 point framework for a culture of health, but you guys will have my slides. But I, I think that's a, a really underlying important principle um, and, and is certainly informing some of our work at Academy Health. Now one of the things, an example of cross-sector collaboration is uh, this work called the Community Health Peer Learning Program. It's funded by the Office of the National Coordinator. And again, it's in that sweet spot of where we work to build the science of health services and policy research. It's looking at data. But here, it's data to improve population health. And so we, the ONC gave us the money, then we put out you know, a call for applications, and we funded 10 participant communities and five subject matter expert communities. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this program because it's very exciting. Um, it's again to support a cross-sector data movement that empowers communities to address social determinants of health, to stimulate and support peer learning and collaboration, and build the evidence base for how do you actually use multi-sector data to improve health. Um, and so that's just, again, the um, theory of change that if you bring these three aspects together, that is going to build the capacity to drive community health improvement over the long term. Now, were any of you ever involved in the Beacon program? when it was funded. So this came out of the High Tech Act. And the goal was, oh, somehow we're just going to, it was focused on interoperable data. And we're going to make all this data interoperable and life will be better, right? Sort of version 1.0. This is kind of a version 2.0, which is much more steeped in the pragmatic of how hard it is to do this, um, to actually do the cross-sector work and then use it to drive community health improvement. What happened then, though, is that there was another project funded by RWJ called DASH, Data Across Sectors for Health. And so we started working together. And there's this sort of uber network, network of networks, called All In, um, Data for Community Health. And um, it's a network of 25 projects across the country. And you'll see it's pretty, you know, it's in all kinds of different geographic scales. Um, and look at just the diversity of sectors that are represented in these communities. It really is much more than just public health and health care. Uh, justice, parks and rec, um, public safety, law enforcement, transportation, you see all of the different communities. And um, the types of data that they're using, again, is incredibly, incredibly vari not variable. Was the, have you heard all the V's for data? So it's we need volume, velocity, veracity, validity. I mean, think of a V. You can call it. Part of <laughs> so lots of different types of data. Lots of variety of data is being looked at. And importantly, they're not looking at it for just all the same topics. If you look at the populations and the conditions, again, serious and persistent mental illness, disabilities, the homeless. I mean, this is tough work trying to figure out how to do data to drive health improvement for some of these highly vulnerable populations. Um, and the final innovation project I want to mention that we're doing is funded by Robert Wood Johnson. And this is looking at payment reform for population health. Because again, pay, sort of the word value and financial incentives, that is really driving sort of the daily conversation in Washington. 
And so the question is, how do you actually do this for population health? And you know, most of the, this is uh, John Auerbach's um, three buckets of prevention. And so, um, and again, this doesn't show well here. There's some, there's some more little graphics things here. But most of the population health focus is really sort of maybe coming into this. Um, and the question is really, how do you reach whole geographic populations um, with these financial incentives? And how do you create sustainable uh, payment models that actually move folks much more towards that third bucket of population health and prevention? And so this is um, some of the work that our, our group is early work that they're doing. Um, and again, looking across both the engagement in enablers, how do you support this? And then the vehicles, is it direct payment? Do you have a direct, do you direct the workforce? How do you contract? So really trying to think very differently across a continuum, you see at the top here, across a continuum of different ways of thinking about realigning payment structures to promote population health. And because this is funded by RWJ, we're using the emergent strategy. You don't know what the next step's going to be. So that's <laughs> kind of interesting. And you know, for, for our staff, we're used to, here's my timeline, here are my toll gates, I've got to have this ready by this. It uh, causes some anxiety. So it's been interesting managing that process as well and learning from it. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention the ARC Innovations Exchange. Have any of you ever seen this database? So this was developed by ARC. It has over 600 innovation profiles that are relevant to reducing disparities in healthcare. It's all about innovations. And, uh, it's, and there's a certain amount that the content is organized by various axes, patient population, type of intervention, condition, tool use, setting, partners, all kinds of ways you, you can search by. And it has over 1,400 innovations or tools related to improving care for vulnerable populations. Because our country is very good at reinventing the wheel, right? We're a big country. Everybody thinks they've come up with a unique idea. I've done it myself. The reality is somebody probably has tried it somewhere else. Why don't you learn from them first? And yes, build on it and take it further. But there may be something out there that you can you know, accelerate how quickly you get to success or impact or don't go down a rabbit hole that somebody else has tried. Now, getting people to report and um, put failures in here is very hard. We hate to talk about failure. It's like the, it's that, uh, the unpublished bias. So, um, so I've talked about some definitions, what we do at Academy Health, where we're seeing some progress in the evidence for population health and health disparities, and how important innovation in our data, in our methods, and who and how we do our work across sectors are all things that we're spending a lot of time on. Thank you. So we have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes for some questions. All I can say is, wow. Have you grown since I left Washington? Can you give us a sense of um, the infrastructure you have and how many staff? Sure. You know, yeah. uh, that sort of what assets are you drawing on to do all this? Yeah, so we have about 68 staff and um, a budget of about 13 million, um, of which about 60% is funded through extramural grants and contracts. Historically, Academy Health has done that work with a lot of RWJ national program offices, you know, these anchor programs we had for 15, 20 years, million dollars each. Well, they're after this year, bye-bye. So that's an interesting transition for us. Um, but uh, yeah, about 30% of our budget is events. And, uh, and then about 10% is membership dues. So, um, but it's an incredible staff. I've just, I've loved working there. They're really talented. And you know, one of the things that's been a lot of fun is partnering, I was mentioning this in my meeting earlier with Anna, with our organizational members. We have individual members and we have organizational members. So for example, when RWJ put out their RFP for these new human capital programs, they're changing all their old clinical scholars, health and society scholars, et cetera. We said, wow, these look like great things. We could help. So we e wrote to all our organizational affiliates and said, you know, if you're applying, <coughs> here's what we could do to help you apply. And we ended up applying, being partners. And we're now involved in three of those four programs. So again, you know, what we do well, which is the translation, the learning communities, bring, trying to accelerate the work that everybody does. Um, so again, if you haven't figured it out, I, my pet peeve is reinvention and lack of progress. Sort of want to make a difference, because I don't have that many more decades to go in my career. Can I ask about a different question? Sure, please. So about the financial incentives. Can you speak louder? Oh, sure. Yeah. So about the financial incentives for public health programs. 
So in, in healthcare services, it's really through who the payer is for yes. the financial So in the public health model, who's the payer? Right, and they're look. It's uh, you know the question is who's the payer in the public health or population health model, um, and they're looking at all those variations because I think there's also a lot of um, flux right now. And I heard this term recently of now there are pay payviders, they are payers and providers because they're blending these models as different types of organizations take on different levels of risk. Um, in Maryland, for example, I mean they they gave hospitals global budgets and incentivized them for accountability to population health for their geographic areas. So the answer is no one simple thing. That I think we're just starting to collect examples of these different ways that they're trying to get outside the traditional sort of federal dollars and state, you know, for public health programming, you know, that trickle down through the state and then the local health department and then the health care dollars that are over here. And how do you cr cross those silos? I, it's not easy. So we haven't found the solution yet. I, I don't think there is one solution. I think that we're really um, hoping to learn from lots of innovative. I think Oregon's doing some really interesting work beyond the CCOs. Washington State is doing some very interesting work. Um, but come to one of our meetings and hear all about it. I, can't, I, I don't know it. <laughs> so. Thank you for your talk. So in terms of your work around dissemination and pushing out evidence to policymakers, you said that you focus on federal and state and less so local. Why is that? Is it because of the complexity of establishing relationships with you know, hundreds of jurisdictions across the US, or is it because you see you know, the main policy levers are at the federal and state level and less so local? Uh, yes and yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, the reality, for any of you who've worked in the community, what's, the most, what's one of the most important characteristic of, of any translational activity? Trusted relationships. People want to know who you are. So you don't show up and say, hey, here's my evidence. I want you to use it. You build that relationship over time. Certainly when I worked in Cincinnati and we were active and statewide doing some childhood obesity legislation, I mean, it took a long time. So pragmatically, it just doesn't make sense. And there are lots of other players, whether it's NHO or others, who work at the community level. And you know, it's now the Community Health Peer Learning Program, those community, those actors are working at the community level. It's just we're not. We're facilitating their action. Same with PopCop. We see our role as facilitating others' actions so that they can learn from each other. So, all right. I, think I have a kind of follow-up question, which is you brought up this interesting idea of the public health department being the hub for population health and intersectoral collaboration. I wonder if public health departments see themselves as playing that role and the challenges of getting, uh, and the challenges of, of, of making them to accept or, or take on that role. Some do, some don't. Again, wide variation. And, and also, the history of local health departments in this country is, is so different. I mean, LHDs in the South have played a very tr different role historically than local health departments in the urban Northeast. Um, so I think there's huge variation to answer that question. Some are. I mean, in conversations, again, with folks who know this much better than I do, John Auerbach, Josh Sharfstein, all these other guys, um, you know, they really do see that in some communities, the local health, the, the city or county health department, or state, you know, more city, county, has the authority and respect and, and stature within that stakeholder community to play that role. In others, no way. It's, so I think it really varies by the history in that community and, frankly, the leadership. Who's in, who's in charge and, how, you know, whether the, and that's why um, I think it was uh, Betty's, no, it wasn't Betty's paper, Julie's paper, talking about we've got to understand what it takes to be one of those leaders who will sort of step up and be the chief health strategist. So, again, that servant leader model, I think, is a, a pretty important approach to it, not saying you should, you know, I should do this because I'm government. <laughs> but very much the servant leader model. So, well, thank you all very much.